I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, Imagineer and audio animatronic animator, Doug Griffith, to the show. Welcome to the show, Doug. It's nice to be here, Tammy. It's nice to have you here. I was just telling you off air that I saw you in an MGM Studios documentary, which I will link below in the show notes. Um, You had been an animator for audio animatronics. Like, your list is amazing. And we're going to be talking about a couple of, of those attractions, you know, from Kitchen Cabaret to The Great Movie Ride to Horizons to Hall of Presidents. There's so much to cover and really unique pieces on your resume that as a kid made me so excited to partake in the future of what was Epcot and the parks themselves. So this is going to be a really fun conversation today. I know for sure um, because I can't wait. I have so many questions for you. But, but one of my first things I wanted to start out is kind of the guidance to being an Imagineer from some of the several conversations I've had with other individuals. It's, it's not the same path. Like everybody does a little bit, uh, does something a little bit different in their early years. And then suddenly kind of the Imagineer position happens upon them. So how did that work for you? Well, it, it literally happened upon me because I never wanted to be an Imagineer actually. I when when I was a kid, uh, I was I was enamored with you know feature animation, and that's what I wanted to do. And from probably, uh, I mean, I I was drawing in kindergarten, but probably from about sixth or seventh grade, about middle school, on, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I'd actually written to the studio at one point. I think I might have been uh, maybe a maybe a junior in high school, possibly a sophomore, I can't really remember, but I wrote to the studio and said, you know, what, what would I have to do to get here? And, and a guy wrote back, his name was Don Duckworth. And he told me, you know, um, what I should be doing as far as drawing and drawing from action and all that. And, and that was kind of the path uh, that I, I set out. So I'm, I want to be, you know, a Disney animator, a, a hand-drawn animator. So uh, as I graduated from college or from high school, I mean, I was looking for programs that had character animation. And at that time, there were very, very few in the country. And Cal Arts kept coming up. And, uh, you know, it was expensive. And I thought, well, maybe I'll get, uh, you know, an associate's degree in some other type of art. And that's what I set out to do. I uh, went to a, a small college in West Virginia for a semester that had just started a commercial art program. And uh, halfway through the first semester, they fired the, the guy that was running it. <laughs> so um, my plan at that point was get an associates in commercial art, keep, uh, keep working, you know, till I can get enough money to go to Cal Arts. So that kind of threw a monkey wrench into that. And I applied to Cal Arts anyway. At the time, the character animation program at Cal Arts accepted 30 students a year. And you had to, you know, it started... You couldn't come in mid-semester. You couldn't come in the winter winter semester. It was only starting in fall. By the time I found out that my program director was gone at the other school, I had missed the deadline. So what I did, I worked a year uh, in a department store to save money and then applied. You know, the, the following year, I got accepted. And at Cal Arts at the time, I'm not sure if it's still like that, but if you're in the character animation uh, group, which was in the film school, but we had our own classes. We had a lot of the, uh, the old guys, um, you know, it was, it was amazing when I look back on it, just to have the, the privilege of learning under, you know, T. He and Elmer Plummer, Ken O'Connor, uh, Jack Hanna. And it, it was great. But at the time, at, at your sophomore year, you were eligible to be hired by the studio. Every year they would come up and do, uh, they called it the Disney show. And basically uh, your freshman year, besides your other classes, you had to make a, at least like a one minute silent film, one or two minutes. Your sophomore sophomore year, you learned sound. So you learned to cut that, edit that. And then your, your film had sound and it was a bit longer. And what they would do... Um, People from the studio would come up and they would, you know, re- sit through f- basically four hours of pencil tests. And then if they were looking for people, um, you know, they would give offers. So uh, at the end of my sophomore year, um, I think they took 13 of us that year. And I got an offer from the studio and I got an offer from WDI. 
and you know it's like I did I, I went and did the interview at WDI and at the time they had um, I think they had uh, the auction scene from Pirates of the Caribbean that they were doing for Tokyo Disneyland set up at Tahongo, which was this huge staging or staging facility in North Hollywood. And I remember walking in to that staging area and uh, they always set stuff up, you know, before it went, we always pre-programmed things before it went to the field. So we would set up, sometimes it got very elaborate, the whole sets and everything would be there. This particular one, it wasn't the sets. But all the electronics were there, and I walked into there going, I, I don't want to do this. I said, I don't know anything about computers. I I, I'm not technical in any way. So what I did, I, um, I turned that offer down, and I took the studio offer, and this was in May. And um, so we all went home for the summer, and we're supposed to come back and start in August. And then uh, they put you through a kind of a, a training program with Eric Larson at the time. So I get a call. I can't remember exactly when it was. I think I was home for about four weeks and I got a call from the studio and they basically um, said, well, you know, the offer we gave you, it's not on the table anymore. Uh, so they kind of retracted the offer. <laughs> uh, kind of a strange thing, but, but it all worked out really well. I called my director at the school and said, what's going on? And he said, don't take it personally. He said, it's political in some way. He said, my advice is to, to call WDI back, which was WED at the time, WED Enterprises. It wasn't even WDI. And he said, uh, tell them, you know, just get in, just get in the company. So I did. Uh, they had hired uh, another animator in the meantime, uh, Michael Sprout, uh, who was a great guy, went on to be one of the uh, really good writers there. Uh, but uh, they still needed people. So um, they, they still gave me the position. I started in August. And uh, from there, it's just all downhill. I, I remember walking in there several times during the first few weeks thinking, did I make a mistake? I was sitting, uh, they were animating um, Mickey. Well, it would have been the Mickey Mouse review that had come back from, from Tokyo or that, had come, that they were going to send to Tokyo. I had come from Walt Disney World and they were redoing all that. And I sat for six weeks uh, watching another animator uh, program. I think it was the Three Caballeros. Uh, <laughs> so uh, just learning how to run the Anacon, uh, which is the board that we used to animate on. And then um, by that time, my, my show was ready and Kitchen Cabaret was the first show I was assigned to. And the cool thing about uh, that job as an audio and electronics animator, you know, right off the bat, um, you had the whole show. Uh, there were times when we helped each other out, you know, as far as animators, they would source more than one. But at that time, if you were assigned to a show, you were at you, you animated everything. And uh, that was my first introduction um, into into audio and electronics animation. And uh, at the time, Waithel Rogers was still there. I was really fortunate. Uh, Blaine Gibson was still there. I, I worked a lot more with Waithel than Blaine. Blaine used to come over and, you know, just kind of check the figures out. How once they were ready to be programmed to make sure there weren't screw heads sticking through where you could see through the clothes and anatomical things. But uh, Waithel, Waithel directed us and uh, he was he was awesome. So Kitchen Cabaret was the first project you did. And what year did you start Imagineering? I, I, I missed it. Was it 1986, you said, or? 1981. 1981. Uh, OK, mm -hmm. so you, you do you do the entire animation of the Kitchen Cabaret show? Just you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then at the time, uh, the lighting, uh, the lighting guys, I had to sit with the lighting guys, too. And they would tell me exactly where to ramp their lights up and down. But we were animating the lights through the Anacon also. And, and they always put us with uh, we worked as a team. There was a programmer and an animator and, and people used to get us confused. They, they used to think that we did the same thing. But the programmers were the technical support, and uh, they did all the computer stuff. Uh, I Eric Swap uh, was was mine. Of course, when we were at Tahunga, uh, everything was you know doing Epcot and um, and Tokyo at the same time. It was running I think 24 hours a day. I remember pulling some night shifts there uh, just to get you know all the work was coming through there. The sets were being built there, and the uh, pre programming was being done there. So. We had a we had a kind of a pool of programmers, but Eric and I through the years had got teamed up together 
a lot of the time and we really got to be very close and he knew they usually set the functions up for you, for you and the figures. Um, at the time, <laughs> it was very primitive uh, with those old control systems. You basically had a couple of screws and a card, and each function had a card, and you could you could bring it off the stops, you know, so it wouldn't hit on the ends when you would move it end to end. Uh, but then the only other adjustment you really had that we used was called gain, and that's how fast it could move. So you would literally be sitting there at the console, turning the knob and saying, you know, up a half, up a quarter, up and, you know, turn the gain up a half a turn, a quarter a turn. If it get too high, the figure would start to shake. And I'd say down a quarter, down a half. And after a while, if you worked with the programmer, uh, they, would, they would know how you'd like the figure set up. So a lot of times you would come into a figure, they had already, you know, have tuned some things in because they had to check it out anyway. And that was a big help. And Eric was also, he was a really good mouth programmer. I know some of the stuff, I just let him do the mouth programming because he was, he was really good at it. Well, considering with the mouth programming that you had all of these songs, so you're working on Kitchen Cabaret and Horizons and Journey into Imagination, and you have those typical theme songs of Epcot that everybody remembers, even all these years later, were they getting stuck in your head? Because <laughs> you guys were like the first to hear them, right? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, very repetitive. The way that the way that we animated back then, and still today, I mean, most of the stuff in our, in our parks is legacy, legacy figures. And I know uh, during my the last you know decade there, the last five six years there, we moved to, to animating in CG and Maya, and uh, then porting the the data into the figures. Uh, back in those days, well, Maya wasn't even around, but uh, you had to do everything by hand. And the way the Anacon was set up, they set it up and wrote the programming. The APCS was actually the, the proprietary software uh, that they written, had written. But uh, they set it up for an animator. You know, Bill Justice, and he was one of the animators. Uh, Waitho, of course. And so they all came from the studio, and they set the systems up for animators. And that's why they, they sought animators to animate it, because... You know, it's a very narrow field, audio animatronics or, or outside. They can't use our registered names. They, they just call them animatronics. But at the time, other people that were doing it were using engineers primarily because the systems were, you know, the input systems, you had to be able to understand it. And I'm not even sure if artists could. Some could. Some were right and left brain. I was not one of those. But you could actually puppet the figure if you wanted. The way the Anacon was set up, uh, every function uh, – on that particular figure, and, and the figures had different ones, right? Some of them were very simple. Some of them may have had like five, six functions. Others had a really complicated figure. Uh, I think Hopper was the most complicated. He had upwards of, I think he had over 75. I can't remember the exact number. Uh, so each knob on the Anacon was one function. So if you had an arm forward was one, an arm out was one, an arm swing was one, you know, a head turn was one. And you could literally, um, it was driven by time code. So uh, we had the audio tapes running and you could set up your scenes on it so that when it hit a certain point in a show, it would automatically start the system. So you could be on the knob ready if you wanted to actually live time it and puppeteer it. You could also do the traditional, like we learned in film animation, keyframing. You know, you put in your, you just go to a certain um, part, a certain footage point, right? And then you would put the keyframe in and and we would kind of do a combination of both. We'd usually block it in and then do some live timing on the second pass. And then on the third pass is when you kind of clean it all up. Uh, as we got into the newer systems uh, with the Wicked Witch of the West and the Great Movie Ride, that was the first A100 uh, system that enabled us because of the compliance in it to move the figures a lot faster without them shaking. And it was also more precision, more precise. So you could do things. I had, I had done some things for for um, the, the Pirates of the Caribbean in Paris where I'd, the auctioneer, kind of in the dead time between when he was doing stuff, he had to figure out, you know, how to keep him alive. So I had him, like, look like he was scratching his eye. Uh, it, you could get that close. And it was repeatable. Uh, to, pretty, pretty repeatable. The old figures you... If you would try to do that on, they might be scratching the eye one day and the next day scratching his nose and the next day, who knows, he's out in space somewhere. Just 
because the systems weren't tight enough. So uh, with the witch and with the, you know, the witch was actually a prototype. Uh, that was and, and we're talking a, about the witch in the great movie ride. Sorry the, to interject. In the great movie ride. Just, yeah, I jumped, like, this is a really movie. important yeah. one. Yeah, because I, I really wanted to ask you about this because this was featured on the documentary. And I remember that that was the hype about the great movie ride. It was going to have this audio animatronic that was like no one had ever seen before. Yeah, I had, um, you know, at the time... Uh, I had just come back. I came back. They hired me back. Actually, I was laid off after a year after Epcot opened. Uh, and I had come back. I was going on that stuff when the A100 stuff was being developed. It was a. It was kind of a collaboration with the University of Utah. And they had uh, kind of a, a focus on prosthetics, that group there. So during the period I was gone, I was gone from uh, the end of 83 to 87. Um, and when I came back, they hired me back t to do the great movie ride. So I had done, when I was at Epcot, I had done uh, Kitchen Cabaret. Uh, I went on from Kitchen Cabaret to do the original uh, Journey into Imagination with Tony Baxter. And then uh, a year later uh, was Horizons. And then after Horizons, when I came back from the field, um, I was still based in Glendale at that time. I was laid off with, as well as a ton of other people. Uh, but when, when I came back, that kind of interim time, I wasn't there when, you know, they were doing all this development. So when I came back, it's they were just bringing the prototypes in uh, for the, A, uh, uh, the A100 technology. And, and it was really cool. I mean, the stuff that we had to use using kind of the, uh, <laughs> the turning a couple screws, you know, just to get what you wanted to these new cards. With compliance, they had a lot more uh, ability to control things, soften things, um, make things move quickly with stability. And the programmers, they had to learn all that too, right? They had to kind of get up to speed on that. So um, the witch was really interesting because we set up every scene, with, like the set, most most every set for the great movie ride in Tahunga. So the the Wizard of Oz scene was the last scene before we were shipping out, you know, to go to the field. And they had everything. They had all the munchkins in. They had all the set. I remember they used to push the executives around. They had kind of a, a little dolly built. It was about the size of the ride car. And it was on casters. And they would, like, push them through, <laughs> which was kind of funny at the time. But to try to get as close as they can, you know, the stuff that we use previs for now and CG, you know, it wasn't around back then. But I didn't get a chance to really ring that figure out in the new technology when I was at, and still at Tahunga. Uh, so I got something in, but when we got to the field in Florida, uh, I had, I just spent hours and hours and talking about what you mentioned earlier, these uh, songs and things get stuck in your head. What I, what I did, uh, I kind of developed this for my own benefit. Uh, video, audio animatronic figures on video usually don't look very good. Um, so what I was doing, I was videotaping my scenes uh, toward the latter part of that show, and especially with The Witch. And I go home every night and watch them over and over and over again and analyze it. And my wife got so sick of that. She, I think she can still... Uh, tell you the the witch's dialogue today <laughs> you know all these years later but what it did it it trained your eye it it made you you really just notice everything because if you got it to the point where on video it looked pretty good it was going to look great in real life uh so i really was in that scene so long they had a little joke about it in the alien scene uh on one of the it was a console, but basically all it was was a little transparency that they printed out like all our names. And then they had something funny, you know, of what our status was. And mine was still programming the witch. <laughs> and that, that was kind of it. <laughs> I love that. I love those little tidbits that they do in the, in the ride itself. Now, what, what, what were the thoughts of, did anybody actually from Margaret Hamilton's family come to see the figure? I don't know if, if she was, if she had passed away at that time, but I know a lot of the individuals who were still alive, either they were alive or their loved ones were, 
you know, at least consulted, like the John Wayne family. Do you remember if anybody came to see Margaret's specific figure? No, I don't remember anybody coming to see her. Um, we had uh, Humphrey Bogart's daughter, I think, uh, came because he was, uh, he was uh, you know, one of the scenes, the Casablanca scene. Uh, Gene Kelly came by. He, I didn't really, he was kind of at a distance. You know, he was, he was pretty old. They brought him in. The Wayne family was probably the most engaging. I, me- I remember uh, having lunch with them once. They took us out. And uh, it was, um, I can't remember. It was one of John Wayne's daughter and his son. And I cannot remember which ones they were. But they were great. They were, they were really involved um, in the whole process. And I'm trying to think of anybody else. Uh, um, Mel Brooks showed up in the alien scene one time. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even remember why. <laughs> it's, but he was there uh, during the, you know, basically the pre-programming for that. Um, Paul Rubens came by. I because he had, was doing some of the media stuff that day. Um, you know, Pee Wee Herman was popular at the time, so he came by and um, saw what I was doing in the in the witch scene. Um, so yeah, occasionally people like that would come by, um, kind of fast forwarding uh, a little bit further when we were doing the extraterrestrial alien encounter. Um, I, I designed the, the Sir figure, which is in the pre-show. And uh, I was animating and somebody had walked in and it's Robbie Benson and he was standing back, um, you know, was watching me and he was there for something else too. So, you know, occasionally, you know, celebrities would come in, but, um, and then, you know, some of them, you know, we got to work with like Ellen, uh, when they put her in the energy, uh, pavilion. Uh, oh gosh, please tell me about that. Because I, recently it was like two, three years ago, they were making fun of the audio animatronic and the ride closing. So please tell me more about that. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't one of our bright and shining moments for AA figures. <laughs> I don't think, but, uh, you know, we put our best effort toward it. Uh, she was very funny. Uh, uh, I did get to go to L.A. for her recording session. And thankfully, uh, Rick Rothschild, who um, he was one of the show producers there that I worked a lot with. He pulled me in on a lot of his shows. And uh, I forget who it was. I think Tom Fitzgerald said, yeah, I want you to go out and like, you know, be in a recording session for Ellen. And I'd never done anything like that before, especially not with a celebrity. And uh if if Rick wasn't there, I don't think it would have went very well because Rick was kind of seasoned at it. And but she was she was very funny. They she came in and she I think was a bit under the weather. She had a cold or something. And um, it, of course, you know, she was being herself. Uh, but I remember one thing I told her uh, with AA figures, we're getting better. You know, the Navi, the shaman figure, you know, has a lot of articulation in the face. But, you know, back then and even now with our human faces, we don't have a lot of a deformation in the mouth area. And I said, you know, try not to like accent. I remember telling her, try not to like, you know, kind of sit on your O's because we can't really make an O sound. And, and she took that and kind of ran with it. That's, that's the one thing I remember uh, from that session. And also just being very thankful that, that Rick was there to keep it professional. And I just want to go back to Great Movie Ride because there was a rumor, and I think you might be able to either confirm or deny this, because the rumor was that when Great Movie Ride closed, that certain audio animatronics were reused for the updated 2018 Pirates of the Caribbean scene with the new pirate Red. So yes. do you do you know what rumor I'm referring to on that? Yeah, and, and I was a creative director on on that, on the auction scene. So I, I don't know very well what we use. Uh, yes, there were parts used from um, those figures. We try to do that. You know, if we can, uh, it's not like, it, you know, a lot of times when you hear the rumors going around and and it's it's not like you say, okay, well, that was the witch or that was, it's it's really the parts, the, the, the parts that you would never recognize, right? I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's like the a, It's like a, a combination of everything. It's not exactly just one figure. It's a combination no. of different figures. Sounds like no, and it's a it's a way you know to to recycle things you know so that you don't have waste, and it's all also a way you know that you can um, get figures sometimes that you maybe couldn't have afforded 
you know, because it's like if you had to start from scratch and build everything up. So anytime a show goes down, you know, there's always kind of an inventory of parts that, that mm -hmm. they would try to keep. And some of them, if they would use them in other things, it would be a little it would be a little bit more of the of the figure than others and others just like, OK, this arm's going here, this leg tube's going there type of thing. You know, it's uh, it's 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 that that type of a thing. What about the outside design? Because there was a rumor that it was partially based off of what Jane looked like in the Tarzan scene. Yeah, no, that's no, there's nothing to that. It it is. It was actually the redhead uh, sculpt. We took it and uh, we had a, we have a great digital sculptor, uh, Robert King. It actually works for entertainment, but we we used to source him. I say we WDI. You know, I'm not there anymore, but we used to source him a lot because he was so good. So. Uh, what I did um, w when I would do animation design, I, I use ZBrush, uh, which is a digital sculpting tool, and that's Robert's main tool. So I could like get things so far. I would actually concept in ZBrush. I would take my stuff into Maya and do kind of rough rigs and start to move things around. Uh, and then once I got you know what I thought was feasible, and then it would kind of move on to the next next thing. And and in the sculpting area, that was Robert King. So. He started actually with, I think it was a digital scan of the actual redhead's uh, head. Uh, and then we changed, we changed it. We changed the expression, of course, on it. Kind of to go on from that, I adored Innoventions as a kid. It was so much fun to explore the West and East buildings, which were housing different type of new advances in technology and games and things for children to learn along with their parents. And when I saw your resume saying that you had worked with um, Tom 2.0, who kind of introduced, you know, interventions early in the 90s and, and two, uh, well, late in the 90s and early 2000s. And you had also done the Great Piggy Bank Adventure and the Kim Possible World Showcase Adventure. I was like, oh my gosh, like this, again, a wave of of a, a flood of memories basically for me so they were going to do an update obviously to interventions so when did you hear about being on board for that and what they were kind of looking for for this update well i had i believe if i remember right that was around 2000 around yeah uh, i was a liaison to our creative liaison to r d for about two years and at the time i was actually sitting in r d and they were messing around with that Minimatronic before it ever became Tom 2.0. And I was doing, actually, you know, working with them. Uh, we had a, uh, he was one of our performance directors in show quality uh, at the time, Gary Rohrman. We actually used to do classes together. We used to go to California for like a whole week and, and to our show designers do these classes because he was an actor uh, and he did improv and he was tremendously talented. But we had him we came up with this whole <laughs> this whole idea of um that you could go to this website it was like a fake website because we just needed a vehicle to try out these ideas and that you could buy you know you could buy a robot that would improve your life and for this little demo that we did internally this the precursor to tom 2.0 the minimatronic he was a salesman, but he would go into all these like different, like he was Swedish at one point, he had a Swedish accent, and then he would he would go into, you know, another pitch. And, and it was all Gary Rorman that did all that. And I remember one of the executives uh, uh, in R&D, uh, years and years after that, he kept talking about this crazy thing that we had done with this Minimatronic. So by the time he showed up as, you know, as Tom 2.0, you know, in, in Epcot, in Interventions, you know, he already had like a little bit of a life before that. And it was quite funny, actually. But that was that was really interesting because that's that was an exercise in minimalism. Right. I mean, the name it's even in the name uh, electric motors, these little electric motors doing cable driven uh, actuation, which normally on our AA figures now now they're going all electric. But in those days, it was hydraulics and pneumatics. So the control that you had, it was very crude. So I always looked at those things as kind of a challenge because even through the years coming up through doing audio animatronics, uh, you would get figures sometimes with just a couple functions and you had to, you had to try to make them, you know, look alive, the, make, try to make them look believable. 
So you're always looking at downplaying your weaknesses, trying to emphasize your strengths. Uh, and, and, and that Minimatronic was definitely one of them. And then, of course, they did the, you know, the Imagineer that, which it's funny. I was in one of those. Uh, and uh, my daughter at the time, my oldest daughter, I think she might have been about nine. And uh, she gets a kick out of that to this day. Uh, because she was, I believe, Sarah from Ohio. She got to ask one of the questions at the end. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so funny. Uh, do you have a copy of that? I would love to see it because I remember seeing Imagineer that on Disney Channel all the time. I loved it. And I love that Tom hosted it. But do you have the the version of you? I It's out there floating around because it, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, I, no. I remember at the time the directors, they wanted me to kiss him or something. I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> What? Wait, what? Because <laughs> they they had me like for this for the um, the little gig they had it was like well I was supposed to be his dad right I was supposed to be you know his I brought him to life and it, it, you know the silliness of of television but it was fun uh, but yeah it's it's not one of the uh, it's not one of the interviews I like I really point people to it's usually my friends find it and like bring it up to embarrass me <laughs> oh. Well, I, I have to see it. I'll, I'll try to see if I can find it. And as long as you're okay with it, I'll put it in the show notes so people... Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> because some people don't know who Tom Morrow is, you know what I mean? He he was there for a long time. I was looking it up. He was there until about 2007. And I remember at then going to the piggy bank race, I remember we were going back and we had heard that they were going to close interventions. So we were playing the game and we love the great piggy bank race. It's like three different games you play about and learning how to save money and you take your little piggy bank which is um and has like a little chip in it so it knows the game that you're playing and that it's your specific game so it tallies up the points and I just said I said wouldn't it be fun to get one of these (laughs) one of the little piggy banks I just want to take it home (laughs) well I think that well I know this for a fact because uh I, I don't know if they're still available but T. Row Price was, I believe, selling them because they, because I, I sculpted digitally the piggy bank, and I know they wanted to have a some. I can't remember if they were giving it away. This, and I don't believe this was Disney. I think it was, you know, because T. Row Price had sponsored it. Um, they had like a little. It was like a little bank because they were working with my digital file. I said, you know, because I told them like, look, you don't have to sculpt this again. I have it. <laughs> you know, it's what we used to make the ones that you carry around it was also what was given to the uh the cg animator you know to animate the parts that were on the screen and that one was done in zbrush i wasn't very good at zbrush at the time but uh ended up kind of struggling through it and was able to get all the other pigs that were standing around that were standing up you know on on two feet like with shovels and i think they were i think one in particular i remember they had like uh, coins that, you know, he's shoveling in somewhere. Uh, they were all morphed out of the little one that you carry around. Uh, even the big one that's that's kind of flying above in that scene. So it all came from like that one sculpt. And you also did, you also helped out with the Spaceship Earth refresh. So this was around like 2006? Yeah, I can't remember when it opened. Six, seven, eight in that area. Yeah, yeah like 2006 around that. was a big year because that was i believe that was everest it was and we went on to putting the pirates of the caribbean movie figures into the yeah. pirates of the caribbean I and then we finished that. that year i believe with putting nemo and friends in wow uh, in that's Epcot. a lot and i was involved in all those so i think maybe spaceship was right after that um do you remember, th- were you there for the installation? Because from what I understand, a lot of the Jeremy Irons version ending is still in the ball. Like they didn't even take any of that out. So do you remember the installation process and how in the world that was crafted to to work? I was, I remember going into that show to do some touch up, like after, I can't remember. I And that would have been, I don't think I was in it in 81 to 83 and that stint i believe when i came back to florida it would that would have been around uh, eight years later i was in there so no i don't have any firsthand knowledge i remember those figures like everything else being staged and set up you know at tahunga and having the reviews mark miller uh was the animator 
on that. And he was really more of a mechanical genius uh, than, than an animation background. I, I believe, and uh, I believe he said he worked on the little Robin figures that they had in the Mary Poppins movie. I, I, I may be wrong. I don't want to, you know, give credit to, to somebody that didn't do it, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he told me at one time that he had worked on that. So he had been around for a long time. Uh, and yeah, he did, uh, he was the animator on that show. So I, I never, besides doing the touch up and of course the, you know, the, the, uh, the redo of it, the refresh of it. Cause we were, when we did the refresh, I remember changing things around the, on what we could. It was very, had a very tight budget. Uh, I remember changing the Pharaoh's arms because, um, uh, it seemed a little odd to me that the arm that he was motioning with was between the guest and him, right? Normally you like to open a figure up uh, to the audience. And at the time we had an SQS director, show quality standards director that was involved in a lot of our, our, you know, refreshes and actually a lot of the new stuff too. And his name was Bruce Long and he was so, so awesome. Um, pretty much if, Bruce told you that it couldn't be done. It, it couldn't be done mechanically. And we went through spaceship and we were trying to do all this stuff and uh, trying to just plus it where we could in these little areas. And I remember going in there in the first day that it went down and that figure in particular that we changed the arm positions out on, he had already had it taken apart. I think the project came back at the time and said, no, I said, we changed your mind on that. We might like to save that money. He said, too late. <laughs> but that was just him. He was uh, probably the, the most famous thing uh, that he was known for was, we called it the long elbow. And when we put President Clinton in, at the time, uh, the the design of the elbow with the A100, you couldn't, you didn't have like full range, right? You hit, there were two adjustments that you could make. You could either have it, you know, higher or you could have it straighten. But if you had to have it higher, it couldn't straighten. So with President Clinton and analyzing, you know, his moves and studying him, he did a lot of that. He did that thing with, he, he, had, he did that kind of knuckle point, right? He wouldn't point his finger. He would bend his finger so he wasn't pointing. But, but he was always like make, making gestures. And they were that was a pretty bent elbow that he was making that. So we had to like, that had to be the default. It had to be the high one. And of course, when, then when you put the arms down, you couldn't straighten them. So what I did in the programming was uh, to keep that characteristic, you know, gesture that he had. We set it at the high point. But when his arms came down, I had to put them in front of him, you know, just and it looked natural. It wasn't like that. It wasn't natural. And if I remember right, even the video footage from the White House, you know, when we shot him, he was doing that. You know, that's what he was. Of course, you know, he had a little podium in front of him, though, too. But when Mike Weisner saw it, he said, I don't like that. I want those hands. I want those arms to, you know, go down at his side. Uh, and Bruce Long and Doug Noyes, who was another just great figure designer and mechanic, in like a couple of days, figured out how to reconfigure that elbow and designed a whole new elbow that it could do that. And um, then I had to go back in and touch up the animation, you know, so I could put his arms down. I still kind of like the previous one, you know, where, where his hands went down kind of in front of him. But uh, it, that was just Bruce. Uh, that was kind of uh, what was a, it's the Hannibal quote, you know, I will, I will find a way or I'll make one. And, and, and that's that's pretty much what he lived by. And it was so great to have, you know, somebody like that in your corner on on everything. Uh, it's just like, hey, you know, this doesn't look right. Can I move it here or can I move it there? And, and he would do his best to do it. And like I said, if it couldn't be done um, and he said it couldn't be done, that was it. <laughs> you knew that, you know, he wasn't bluffing you. He wasn't like not moving the head like when he said you. He wanted it moved. He never did that. One of my last questions, I really love the American Adventure attraction. And I really wanted to know what you had worked on with the a couple of the updates for that. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I touched a lot of figures during that update that we did. I guess that was in the early 90s, if I remember right. Uh, they actually put... 
can't remember. I think we put four full A100 figures in there. Uh, Will Rogers was one. Um, ben um, and Mark Twain on the on the uh, torch at the end was one, and then Susan B. Anthony, I believe, was the other one. So they were they were totally changed out. Uh, we had several animators on that one. I remember Deborah Short. She was one of our animators. Um, one of our few women animators. I think she was looking back. I think she might have been the only one that was ever like. We've had women programmers, but I don't. I think she might have been the only woman animator we we had to date. Uh, and, and forgive me if I <laughs> if I don't remember somebody if you're listening, but I believe that she was. So. Uh, she did that. Um, she was working on that most of the time. I did Will Rogers, and I can't remember if Deborah did the ending figure or if Darren Hughes did that. He was another one of our animators. But I, I worked on reprogramming um, FDR. I touched him. I reprogrammed the Teddy Roosevelt and John Muro scene. Um, and I, I touched a lot of figures. Oh, Chief Joseph. We put I can't remember. I think we put individual fingers on him or something. We we do we call it hybrid a hybrid figure when we would take like the newer A100 technology and put it on A1. Or in the case of some of the newer stuff we were doing, we might put an electric head on a hydraulic figure. So the figures don't in their classifications. You can't say yeah that's a that's a total A100 figure. Uh, there were a lot of things in American Adventure that were hybrids. So what we would do, we would keep the A1 structure, but maybe we would put A100 arms on them so that we could get better gestures with the arms. Uh, and that's that was another way to plus the animation, you know, without totally spending a ton of money on doing all new figures. Uh, yeah, that um, that was a really interesting. The most interesting thing <laughs> in that was the Will Rogers figure. And, and Rick Rothschild was, you know, he did the original and he was there for this also. And I remember standing on the stage. I, I just couldn't get Will Rogers to, there was something about him that didn't look right. And I remember Rick and I standing there looking at him, just staring and the figure wasn't moving. And there were a couple things, but the, the thing that was, was the most glaring was that the the wrong eyes were put in them. I believe that the pupils were too small or the irises were too small. So it, it looked like he was drugged or something. You know, it's so weird how this little tiny things, uh, if you don't hit them right, it, it throws everything off. So we corrected that. And then I was trying to find, there's, there's not much footage of Will Rogers that, that I was aware of, but what we could find was one of them was him giving a, a talk, you know, on one of his radio talks, and they had filmed it. And he, he actually pushed his hat up with his, you know, he just put with his thumb, right, pushed it back on his head. And I thought, well, I don't know how often he did that because there wasn't a lot of footage, you know, to, to test it against, but I said, that's a Will Rogers move. So I asked one of the guys, on one of the texts, I said, hey, is there any way that we could move that hat? Because with AA figures, you can't touch, you know, you'll, you'll get wear on things. Like, he couldn't actually touch the hat. And it's like, how can you do this in the field? And uh, he said, well, maybe we could use one of the fingers that we're not using, like the inner part, and put that in the head and move the hat. And uh, that's what they ended up doing. And I talked to Rick Elliott, who was he, he just retired recently, too. He was just another master head builder. And he was given that task on night shift to, to figure that out. And it's kind of the weirdest looking thing. You know, if you don't, if you take the hat off, there's there's like a thumb in his head. <laughs> and it's the mechanism that's moving the hat. So that enabled us to, to get that, that move, that Will Rogers move of him putting his hand up and looking like he's flicked his thumb and pushed his hat back without ever touching it. And I, I love that kind of stuff. You know, Bruce Long did a lot of that. And just just these technical guys that think on their feet. And if you throw something out there, um, they'll find a way to do it. And it's just that that's another thing. I loved working on projects like that because people don't with audio animatronics animation. It's it's so technical that people forget it's an art form. And and I used to give to give talks on that, you know, of just what the the art form really is. But what 
what's really important is when you get technical people and engineers, when they understand what they're building things for, it's like you're trying to make an organic character and you're trying to make an organic character that can actually communicate and has a personality and and has um, agency. You want to make it look like it can think, right? And has experience. The fact that it can also have emotions. If you can hit all those things, um, you've got a winner. And I look back through, and I'd said earlier, maybe 10 or 12 figures that we really, I felt we really knocked it out of the park on. I went back and did an exercise last year and just kind of deconstructed why that was. Because at the time, I didn't really know, right? I mean, it just so happened all these pieces came together. But they came together because the technical and the artistic flowed. And uh, you had the people, and this is something that was encouraging before I left Disney, that I was working a lot with the young engineers. They have this younger generation of engineers has just a passion and a desire to learn the art. And it's really, I think, going to help the whole process moving forward because, you know, they're blurring the lines. And that's something that I want to continue to do, you know, outside the company and just working with uh, the younger generation and especially the ones, the technical ones, you know, and first and that are working with robotics because it's really a total package. You, you can't separate it out. Although a lot of times when you see things, uh, it's the technical part, the technical intervention, the stuff that comes out of R&D, which we need. But they people think, well, that's great new technology and it's going to make this figure look real. It's that, that's not what makes it look real. It's it's that tool in the hands of an artist that puts the spirit of that figure, you know, in the performance. Gosh, I can't thank you enough for being on the show, Doug. This was I there. There are so many things we haven't touched, obviously, um, but hopefully we'll have you back on the show. But I have three Disney theme questions I ask all of my guests. So we'll start with the Donald question of the Fab Three, which is: As a child, what Disney film was one of your favorites to see in the movie theater? The Jungle Book. And our goofy question, what Disney character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? Um, probably the auctioneer in Pirates because I've animated him so many times. <laughs> you probably think he knows me. <laughs> and our Mickey question, if I asked you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind for you? Probably the Frozen song. Um just because I have grandkids. Oh, <laughs> let it go. You like let it go? Yeah, they. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a great song, but uh, yeah, you hear it a lot <laughs> lately. <laughs> yes, it gets stuck in your head. And, yeah. and you know what? Most of the audio animatronics that you worked on, they're in many people's heads. <laughs> they still yeah. are, and some of them are still in the park. Some of them are a distant memory, but you have made your mark. And I want to thank you so much for being a part of the show today, Doug. This was this is really a wonderful time. Sure, Tammy. It was great talking to you. It's good. It's great kind of you know, going down memory lane. And again, it's just like it brings back the memories of the relationships and the people. You know, and that's the greatest thing about it. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog. 